Welcome to Bite at a Time Books, where we read you your favorite classics one bite at a time. My name is Brie Carlisle, and I love to read and wanted to share my passion with listeners like you. If you want to know what's coming next and vote on upcoming books, sign up for our newsletter at biteatatimebooks.com. You'll also find our new t-shirts in the shop, including podcast shirts and quote shirts from your favorite classic novels. Be sure to follow my show on your favorite podcast platform so you get all the new episodes. You can find most of our links in the show notes. But also our website, biteatatimebooks.com, includes all of the links for our show, including to our Patreon to support the show, and YouTube, where we have special behind-the-narration of the episodes. We're part of the Bite at a Time Books Productions Network. If you'd also like to hear what inspired your favorite classic authors to write their novels— and what was going on in the world at the time, check out the Bite at a Time Books Behind the Story podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Please note, while we try to keep the text as close to the original as possible, some words have been changed to honor the marginalized communities who've identified the words as harmful and to stay in alignment with Bite at a Time Books brand values. Today we'll be continuing The Life and Adventures of Robinson Crusoe. By Daniel Defoe. Chapter 14. A Dream Realized. Having now brought all my things on shore and secured them, I went back to my boat and rowed or paddled her along the shore to her old harbor, where I laid her up and made the best of my way to my old habitation, where I found everything safe and quiet. I began now to repose myself, live after my old fashion, and take care of my family affairs. And for a while, I lived easy enough. Only that I was more vigilant than I used to be, looked out oftener, and did not go abroad so much. And if at any time I did stir with any freedom, it was always to the east part of the island, where I was pretty well satisfied the savages never came, and where I could go without so many precautions and such a load of arms and ammunition as I always carried with me if I went the other way. I lived in this condition near two years more. But my unlucky head, that was always to let me know it was born to make my body miserable, was all these two years filled with projects and designs how, if it were possible, I might get away from this island, for sometimes I was making for another voyage to the wreck, though my reason told me that there was nothing left there worth the hazard of my voyage, sometimes for a ramble one way, sometimes another, and I believe verily if I had had the boat that I went from Sally in, I should have ventured to see, bound anywhere I knew not whither. I have been in all my circumstances a memento to those who are touched with the general plague of mankind, whence, for aught I know, one half of their miseries flow. I mean that of not being satisfied with the station wherein God and nature hath placed them, for not to look back upon my primitive condition, and the excellent advice of my father, the opposition to which was, as I may call it, my original sin. My subsequent mistakes of the same kind had been the means of my coming into this miserable condition. For had that providence which so happily seated me at the Brazils as a planter blessed me with confined desires, and I could have been contented to have gone on gradually, I might have been by this time. I mean, in the time of my being in this island, one of the most considerable planters in the Brazils. Nay, I am persuaded that by the improvements I had made in that little time I lived there and the increase I should probably have made if I had remained, I might have been worth a hundred thousand mois de rays. And what business had I to leave a settled fortune, a well-stocked plantation improving and increasing, to turn supercargo to Guinea to fetch Negroes, when patience and time would have so increased our stock at home that we could have bought them at our own door from those whose business it was to fetch them, and though it had cost us something more, yet the difference of that price was by no means worth saving at so great a hazard. But as this is usually the fate of young heads, so reflection upon the folly of it is as commonly the exercise of more years, or of the dear-bought experience of time. So it was with me now, and yet so deep had the mistake taken root in my temper that I could not satisfy myself in my station— but was continually poring over the means and possibility of my escape from this place, and that I may, with great pleasure to the reader, bring on the remaining part of my story. It may not be improper to give some account of my first conceptions on the subject of this foolish scheme for my escape, and how and upon what foundation I acted. 
I'm now to be supposed retired into my castle. After my late voyage to the wreck, my frigate laid up and secured underwater as usual, and my condition restored to what it was before. I had more wealth indeed than I had before, but was not at all the richer, for I had no more use for it than the Indians of Peru had before the Spaniards came there. It was one of the nights in the rainy season in March, the four and twentieth year of my first setting foot in this island of solitude. I was lying in my bed or hammock, awake, very well in health, had no pain, no distemper, no uneasiness of body, nor any uneasiness of mind more than ordinary, but could by no means close my eyes. That is, so as to sleep. No, not a wink all night long, otherwise than as follows. It is impossible to set down the innumerable crowd of thoughts that whirled through that great thoroughfare of the brain, the memory in this night's time. I ran over the whole history of my life in miniature, or by abridgment, as I may call it, to my coming to this island, and also of that part of my life since I came to this island. In my reflections upon the state of my case since I came on shore on this island, I was comparing the happy posture of my affairs in the first years of my habitation here, with the life of anxiety, fear, and care which I had lived in ever since I had seen the print of a foot in the sand. Not that I did not believe the savages had frequented the island even all the while, and might have been several hundreds of them at times on shore there, but I had never known it, and was incapable of any apprehensions about it. My satisfaction was perfect, though my danger was the same, and I was as happy in not knowing my danger as if I had never really been exposed to it. This furnished my thoughts with many very profitable reflections, and particularly this one. How infinitely good that providence is which has provided in its government of mankind such narrow bounds to his sight and knowledge of things. And though he walks in the midst of so many thousand dangers, the sight of which, if discovered to him, would distract his mind and sink his spirits, he is kept serene and calm by having the events of things hid from his eyes and knowing nothing of the dangers which surround him. After these thoughts had for some time entertained me, I came to reflect seriously upon the real danger I had been in for so many years in this very island, and how I had walked about in the greatest security and with all possible tranquility. Even when perhaps nothing but the brow of a hill, a great tree, or the casual approach of night had been between me and the worst kind of destruction, that of falling into the hands of cannibals and savages, who would have seized on me with the same view as I would on a goat or turtle, and have thought it no more crime to kill and devour me than I did of a pigeon or a curlew. I would unjustly slander myself if I should say I was not sincerely thankful to my great preserver, to whose singular protection I acknowledged, with great humanity, all these unknown deliverances were due, and without which I must inevitably have fallen into their merciless hands. When these thoughts were over... My head was for some time taken up in considering the nature of these wretched creatures, I mean the savages, and how it came to pass in the world that the wise governor of all things should give up any of his creatures to such inhumanity, nay, to something so much below even brutality itself, as to devour its own kind. But as this ended in some, at that time, fruitless speculations, it occurred to me to inquire what part of the world these wretches lived in, how far off the coast was from whence they came, what they ventured over so far from home for, what kind of boats they had, and why I might not order myself in my business so that I might be able to go over thither as they were to come to me. I never so much as troubled myself to consider what I should do with myself when I went thither, what would become of me if I fell into the hands of these savages, or how I should escape them if they attacked me. No, nor so much as how it was possible for me to reach the coast, and not to be attacked by some or other of them without any possibility of delivering myself. And if I should not fall into their hands, what I should do for provision, or whether I should bend my course, none of these thoughts, I say, so much as came in my way. But my mind was wholly bent upon the notion of my passing over in my boat to the mainland. I looked upon my present condition as the most miserable that could possibly be, that I was not able to throw myself into anything but death. That could be called worse. And if I reached the shore of the main, I might perhaps meet with relief. 
or I might coast along as I did on the African shore till I came to some inhabited country, and where I might find some relief. And after all, perhaps I might fall in with some Christian ship that might take me in, and if the worst came to the worst, I could but die, which would put an end to all these miseries at once. Pray note, all this was the fruit of a disturbed mind, an impatient temper made desperate, as it were, by the long continuance of my troubles, and the disappointments I had met in the wreck I had been on board of, and where I had been so near obtaining what I so earnestly longed for, somebody to speak to and to learn some knowledge from them of the place where I was, and of the probable means of my deliverance. I was agitated wholly by these thoughts, all my calm of mind and my resignation to providence and waiting the issue of the dispositions of heaven seemed to be suspended, and I had, as it were, no power to turn my thoughts to anything but to the project of a voyage to the main, which came upon me with such force and such an impetuosity of desire that it was not to be resisted. When this had agitated my thoughts for two hours or more, with such violence that it set my very blood into a ferment, and my pulse beat as if I had been in a fever, merely with the extraordinary fervor of my mind about it, nature, as if I had been fatigued and exhausted with the very thoughts of it, threw me into a sound sleep. One would have thought I should have dreamed of it, but I did not, nor of anything relating to it, but I dreamed that as I was going out in the morning as usual from my castle, I saw upon the shore two canoes and eleven savages coming to land, and that they brought with them another savage whom they were going to kill in order to eat him, when on a sudden the savage that they were going to kill jumped away and ran for his life. And I thought in my sleep that he came running into my little thick grove before my fortification to hide himself, and that I, seeing him alone and not perceiving that the other sought him that way, showed myself to him, and smiling upon him encouraged him, that he kneeled down to me seeming to pray me to assist him, upon which I showed him my ladder made him go up, and carried him into my cave, and he became my servant, and that as soon as I had got this man, I said to myself, now I may certainly venture to the mainland, for this fellow will serve me as a pilot, and will tell me what to do, and whither to go for provisions, and whither not to go for fear of being devoured, what places to venture into, and what to shun. I waked with this thought, and was under such inexpressible impressions of joy at the prospect of my escape in my dream, that the disappointments which I felt upon coming to myself and finding that it was no more than a dream were equally extravagant the other way, and threw me into a very great dejection of spirits. Upon this, however, I made this conclusion, that my only way to go about to attempt an escape was to endeavor to get a savage into my possession, and if possible it should be one of their prisoners, whom they had condemned to be eaten, and should bring hither to kill, but these thoughts were still attended with this difficulty, that it was impossible to effect this without attacking a whole caravan of them, and killing them all, and this was not only a very desperate attempt and might miscarry, but on the other hand I had greatly scrupled the lawfulness of it to myself, and my heart trembled at the thoughts of shedding so much blood, though it was for my deliverance. I need not repeat the arguments which occurred to me against this, they being the same mentioned before, but though I had other reasons to offer now, that those men were enemies to my life and would devour me if they could, that it was self-preservation in the highest degree to deliver myself from this death of a life, and was acting in my own defense as much as if they were actually assaulting me and the like. I say, though these things argued for it, yet the thoughts of shedding human blood for my deliverance were very terrible to me, and such as I could by no means reconcile myself to for a great while. However, at last, after many secret disputes with myself, and after great perplexities about it, for all these arguments, one way and another struggled in my head a long time. The eager, prevailing desire of deliverance at length mastered all the rest, and I resolved, if possible, to get one of these savages into my hands, cost what it would. My next thing was to contrive how to do it and this indeed was very difficult to resolve on, but as I could pitch upon no probable means for it, so I resolved to put myself upon the watch, to see them when they came on shore and leave the rest to the event, taking such measures as the opportunity should present, let what would be. 
With these resolutions in my thoughts, I set myself upon the scout as often as possible, and indeed so often that I was heartily tired of it, for it was above a year and a half that I waited and for a great part of that time went out to the west end and to the southwest corner of the island almost every day to look for canoes. But none appeared. This was very discouraging and began to trouble me much, though I cannot say that it did in this case, as it had done some time before. We're off the edge of my desire to the thing, but the longer it seemed to be delayed, the more eager I was for it. In a word, I was not at first so careful to shun the sight of these savages and avoid being seen by them as I was now eager to be upon them. Besides, I fancied myself able to manage one, nay, two or three savages if I had them, so as to make them entirely slaves to me to do whatever I should direct them, and to prevent their being able at any time to do me any hurt. It was a great while that I pleased myself with this affair, but still nothing presented itself. All my fancies and schemes came to nothing, for no savages came near me for a great while. About a year and a half after I entertained these notions, and by long musing had, as it were, resolved them all into nothing, for want of an occasion to put them into execution. I was surprised one morning by seeing no less than five canoes all on shore together on my side of the island, and the people who belonged to them all landed and out of my sight. The number of them broke all my measures." for seeing so many and knowing that they always came four or six or sometimes more in a boat. I could not tell what to think of it, or how to take my measures to attack twenty or thirty men single-handed. So lay still in my castle, perplexed and discomforted. However, I put myself into the same position for an attack that I had formerly provided, and was just ready for action if anything had presented. Having waited a good while, listening to hear if they made any noise at length, being very impatient, I set my guns at the foot of my ladder, and clambered up to the top of the hill by my two stages as usual, standing so, however, that my head did not appear above the hill, so that they could not perceive me by any means. Here I observed by the help of my perspective glass, that they were no less than thirty in number, that they had a fire kindled, and that they had meat dressed. How they had cooked it I knew not, or what it was, but they were all dancing, and I know not how many barbarous gestures and figures their own way round the fire. While I was thus looking on them, I perceived by my perspective two miserable wretches dragged from the boats, where it seems they were laid by and were now brought out for the slaughter. I perceived one of them immediately fall, being knocked down, I suppose, with a club or wooden sword, for that was their way and two or three others were at work immediately cutting him open for their cookery, while the other victim was left standing by himself till they should be ready for him. In that very moment, this poor wretch, seeing himself a little at liberty and unbound, nature inspired him with hopes of life, and he started away from them and ran with incredible swiftness along the sands, directly towards me. I mean, towards that part of the coast where my habitation was, I was dreadfully frightened, I must acknowledge, when I perceived him run my way, and especially when, as I thought, I saw him pursued by the whole body. And now I expected that part of my dream was coming to pass, and that he would certainly take shelter in my grove. But I could not depend by any means upon my dream that the other savages would not pursue him thither and find him there. However, I kept my station, and my spirits began to recover when I found that there was not above three men that followed him, and still more was I encouraged, when I found that he outstriped them exceedingly in running, and gained ground on them so that if he could but hold out for half an hour, I saw easily he would fairly get away from them all. There was between them and my castle the creek, which I mentioned often in the first part of my story, where I landed my cargoes out of the ship, and this I saw plainly he must necessarily swim over, or the poor wretch would be taken there, but when the savage escaping came thither, he made nothing of it, though the tide was then up, but plunging in, swam through in about thirty strokes, or thereabouts landed and ran with exceeding strength and swiftness. When the three persons came to the creek, I found that two of them could swim, but the third could not, and that standing on the other side, he looked at the others but went no farther, and soon after went softly back again, which, as it happened, was very well for him in the end. 
I observed that the two who swam were yet more than twice as strong swimming over the creek as the fellow was that fled from them. It came very warmly upon my thoughts, and indeed irresistibly that now was the time to get me a servant and perhaps a companion or assistant, and that I was plainly called by providence to save this poor creature's life. I immediately ran down the ladders with all possible expedition, fetched my two guns, for they were both at the foot of the ladders as I observed before, and getting up again with the same haste to the top of the hill I crossed towards the sea, and having a very short cut and all downhill placed myself in the way between the pursuers and the pursued, hallowing aloud to them that fled, who looking back was at first perhaps as much frightened at me as at them. But I beckoned with my hands to him to come back, and in the meantime I slowly advanced towards the two that followed, and then rushing at once upon the foremost, I knocked him down with the stock of my piece. I was loath to fire because I would not have the rest here, though at that distance it would not have been easily heard. And being out of sight of that smoke too, they would not have known what to make of it. Having knocked this fellow down, the other who pursued him stopped as if he had been frightened, and I advanced towards him. But as I came nearer, I perceived presently he had a bow and arrow, and was fitting it to shoot at me. So I was then obliged to shoot at him first, which I did, and killed him at the first shot. The poor savage who fled, but had stopped, though he saw both his enemies fallen and killed as he thought. Yet was so frightened with the fire and noise of my peace that he stood stock still and neither came forward nor went backward, though he seemed rather inclined still to fly than to come on. I hallooed again to him and made signs to come forward, which he easily understood and came a little way, then stopped again, and then a little farther and stopped again. And I could then perceive that he stood trembling as if he had been taken prisoner, and had just been to be killed as his two enemies were. I beckoned to him again to come to me, and gave him all the signs of encouragement that I could think of, and he came nearer and nearer, kneeling down every ten or twelve steps in token of acknowledgement for saving his life. I smiled at him and looked pleasantly and beckoned to him to come still nearer. At length he came close to me, and then he kneeled down again, kissed the ground and laid his head upon the ground, and taking me by the foot, set my foot upon his head. This, it seems, was in token of swearing to be my slave forever. I took him up and made much of him and encouraged him all I could, but there was more work to do yet, for I perceived the savage whom I had knocked down was not killed, but stunned with the blow and began to come to himself. So I pointed to him and showed him the savage that he was not dead, upon this he spoke some words to me, and though I could not understand them, yet I thought they were pleasant to hear, for they were the first sound of a man's voice that I had heard, my own accepted for above twenty-five years, but there was no time for such reflections now. The savage who was knocked down recovered himself so far as to sit upon the ground, and I perceived that my savage began to be afraid. But when I saw that, I presented my other piece at the man as if I would shoot him. Upon this, my savage, for so I call him now, made a motion to me to lend him my sword, which hung naked in a belt by my side, which I did. He no sooner had it, but he runs to his enemy and at one blow cuts off his head so cleverly no executioner in Germany could have done it sooner or better, which I thought very strange for one who, I had reason to believe, never saw a sword in his life before except their own wooden swords. However, it seems, as I learned afterwards, they make their wooden swords so sharp, so heavy, and the wood is so hard that they will even cut off heads with them. Aye, and arms, and that at one blow, too. When he had done this, he comes laughing to me in sign of triumph, and brought me the sword again, and with abundance of gestures which I did not understand, laid it down, with the head of the savage that he had killed just before me. But that which astonished him most was to know how I killed the other Indian so far off, so pointing to him he made signs to me to let him go to him, and I bade him go as well as I could. When he came to him, he stood like one amazed, looking at him, turning him first on one side, then on the other, looked at the wound the bullet had made, which it seems was just in his breast where it had made a hole, and no great quantity of blood had followed, but he had bled inwardly, for he was quite dead. He took up his bow and arrows and came back, so I turned to go away and beckoned him to follow me, making signs to him that more might come after them. 
Upon this, he made signs to me that he should bury them with sand, that they might not be seen by the rest if they followed, and so I made signs to him again to do so. He fell to work, and in an instant he had scraped a hole in the sand with his hands big enough to bury the first in, and then dragged him into it and covered him, and did so by the other also. I believe he had him buried them both in a quarter of an hour, then, calling away, I carried him, not to my castle, but quite away to my cave, on the farther part of the island, so I did not let my dream come to pass in that part that he came into my grove for shelter. Here I gave him bread and a bunch of raisins to eat, and a draught of water, which I found he was indeed in great distress for. From his running and having refreshed him, I made signs for him to go and lie down to sleep, showing him a place where I had laid some rice straw and a blanket upon it, which I used to sleep upon myself sometimes. So the poor creature lay down and went to sleep. He was a comely, handsome fellow, perfectly well made, with straight, strong limbs not too large, tall and well shaped, and as I reckon, about twenty six years of age. He had a very good countenance, not a fierce and surly aspect, but seemed to have something very manly in his face, and yet he had all the sweetness and softness of a European in his countenance too, especially when he smiled. His hair was long and black, not curled like wool, his forehead very high and large, and a great vivacity and sparkling sharpness in his eyes. The color of his skin was not quite black, but very tawny, and yet not an ugly, yellow, nauseous tawny as the Brazilians and Virginians, and other natives of America are, but of a bright kind of a dun olive color that had in it something very agreeable, though not very easy to describe. His face was round and plump, his nose small, not flat like the Negro's, a very good mouth, thin lips and his fine teeth well set and as white as ivory. After he had slumbered rather than slept about half an hour, he awoke again, and came out of the cave to me, for I had been milking my goats which I had in the enclosure just by. When he espied me, he came running to me, laying himself down again upon the ground with all the possible signs of a humble, thankful disposition, making a great many antic gestures to show it. At last, he lays his head flat upon the ground close to my foot, and sets my other foot upon his head, as he had done before, and after this made all the signs to me of subjection servitude and submission imaginable, to let me know how he would serve me so long as he lived. I understood him in many things and let him know I was very well pleased with him. In a little time I began to speak to him and teach him to speak to me, and first I let him know his name should be Friday, which was the day I saved his life. I called him so for the memory of the time. I likewise taught him to say Master, and then let him know that was to be my name. I likewise taught him to say yes and no, and to know the meaning of them. I gave him some milk in an earthen pot, and let him see me drink it before him, and sought my bread in it, and gave him a cake of bread to do the like, which he quickly complied with and made signs that it was very good for him. I kept there with him all that night, but as soon as it was day I beckoned to him to come with me, and let him know I would give him some clothes, at which he seemed very glad, for he was stark naked." As we went by the place where he had buried the two men, he pointed exactly to the place and showed me the marks that he had made to find them again, making signs to me that we should dig them up again and eat them. At this, I appeared very angry, expressed my abhorrence of it, made as if I would vomit at the thoughts of it, and beckoned with my hands to him to come away, which he did immediately with great submission. I then led him up to the top of the hill to see if his enemies were gone, and pulling out my glass, I looked and saw plainly the place where they had been, but no appearance of them or their canoes, so that it was plain they were gone, and had left their two comrades behind them without any search after them. But I was not content with this discovery, but having now more courage and consequently more curiosity, I took my man Friday with me, giving him the sword in his hand with the bow and arrows at his back, which I found he could use very dexterously, making him carry one gun for me and I two for myself, and away we marched to the place where these creatures had been, for I had a mind now to get some further intelligence of them. When I came to the place my very blood ran chill in my veins, 
and my heart sunk within me at the horror of the spectacle. Indeed, it was a dreadful sight. At least it was so to me, though Friday made nothing of it. The place was covered with human bones. The ground died with their blood and great pieces of flesh left here and there, half eaten, mangled, and scorched. And in short, all the tokens of the triumphant feast they had been making there, after a victory over their enemies. I saw three skulls, five hands, and the bones of three or four legs and feet, an abundance of other parts of the bodies. And Friday, by his signs, made me understand that they brought over four prisoners to feast upon, that three of them were eaten up, and that he, pointing to himself, was the fourth, that there had been a great battle between them and their next king, of whose subjects it seems he had been one, and that they had taken a great number of prisoners, all which were carried to several places by those who had taken them in the fight, in order to feast upon them as was done here by these wretches upon those they brought hither. I caused Friday to gather all the skulls, bones, flesh, and whatever remained, and lay them together in a heap, and make a great fire upon it, and burn them all to ashes, I found Friday had still a hankering stomach after some of the flesh, and was still a cannibal in his nature. But I showed so much abhorrence at the very thoughts of it, and at the least appearance of it that he durst not discover it, for I had, by some means, let him know that I would kill him if he offered it. When he had done this, we came back to our castle, and there I fell to work for my man Friday, and first of all I gave him a pair of linen drawers which I had out of the poor gunner's chest I mentioned, which I found in the wreck, and which, with a little alteration, fitted him very well, and then I made him a jerkin of goat's skin, as well as my skill would allow, for I was now grown a tolerably good tailor, and I gave him a cap which I made of hare skin, very convenient and fashionable enough, and thus he was clothed, for the present, tolerably well, and was mighty well pleased to see himself almost as well clothed as his master. It is true, he went awkwardly in these clothes at first, wearing the drawers was very awkward to him, and the sleeves of the waistcoat galled his shoulders and the inside of his arms. But a little easing them where he complained they hurt him, and using himself to them, he took to them at length very well. The next day, after I came home to my hutch with him, I began to consider where I should lodge him, and that I might do well for him and yet be perfectly easy myself. I made a little tent for him in the vacant place between my two fortifications, in the inside of my last and in the outside of the first, and there was a door or entrance there into my cave. I made a formal framed door case, and a door to it of boards and set it up in the passage, a little within the entrance, and causing the door to open in the inside I barred it up in the night, taking in my ladders too so that Friday could no way come at me in the inside of my innermost wall without making so much noise and getting over that it must needs awaken me. For my first wall had now a complete roof over it of long poles, covering all my tent and leaning up to the side of the hill which was again laid across with smaller sticks, instead of lathes, and then thatched over a great thickness with rice straw, which was strong like reeds, and at the hole or place which was left to go in or out by the ladder I had placed a kind of trap door, which if it had been attempted on the outside would not have opened at all, but would have fallen down and made a great noise. As to weapons, I took them all into my side every night. But I needed none of all this precaution, for never man had a more faithful, loving, sincere servant than Friday was to me. Without passions, sullenness, or designs, perfectly obliged and engaging, his very affections were tied to me, like those of a child to a father." and I dare say he would have sacrificed his life to save mine upon any occasion whatsoever. The many testimonies he gave me of this put it out of doubt, and soon convinced me that I needed to use no precautions for my safety on his account. This frequently gave me occasion to observe, and that with wonder that however it had pleased God in his providence and in the government of the works of his hands, to take from so great a part of the world of his creatures the best uses to which their faculties and the powers of their souls are adapted. Yet that he had bestowed upon them the same powers, the same reason, the same affections, the same sentiments of kindness and obligation, the same passions and resentments of wrongs, the same sense of gratitude, sincerity, fidelity, and all the capabilities of doing good and receiving good that he has given to us, and that when he pleases to offer them occasions of exerting these, 
they were as ready, nay, more ready to apply them to the right uses for which they were bestowed than we are. This made me very melancholy sometimes, in reflecting, as the several occasions presented, how mean a use we make of all these. Even though we have these powers enlightened by the great lamp of instruction, the Spirit of God and by the knowledge of His Word added to our understanding, and why it has pleased God to hide the like saving knowledge from so many millions of souls, who, if I might judge by this poor savage, would make a much better use of it than we did. From hence, I sometimes was led too far to invade the sovereignty of providence, and as it were, arraign the justice of so arbitrary a disposition of things that should hide that sight from some, and reveal it to others, and yet expect a like duty from both. But I shut it up and checked my thoughts with this conclusion. First, that we did not know by what light and law these should be condemned, but that as God was necessarily and by the nature of his being infinitely holy and just, so it could not be. But if these creatures were all sentenced to absence from himself, it was on account of sinning against the light, which, as the scripture says, was a law to themselves, and by such rules as their consciences would acknowledge to be just, though the foundation was not discovered to us. And secondly, that still as we are all the clay in the hand of the potter, no vessel could say to him, Why hast thou formed me thus? But to return to my new companion, I was greatly delighted with him, and made it my business to teach him everything that was proper to make him useful, handy, and helpful, but especially to make him speak and understand me when I spoke. And he was the aptest scholar that ever was, and particularly was so merry, so constantly diligent, and so pleased when he could but understand me or make me understand him, that it was very pleasant for me to talk to him. Now my life began to be so easy that I began to say to myself that could I but have been safe from more savages, I cared not if I was never to remove from the place where I lived. Thank you for joining Bite at a Time Books today, while we read a bite of one of your favorite classics. Again, my name is Bree Carlisle, and I hope you come back tomorrow for the next bite of The Life and Adventures of Robinson Crusoe. Don't forget to sign up for our newsletter at biteatatimebooks.com and check out the shop. You can check out the show notes or our website, biteatatimebooks.com, for the rest of the links for our show. We'd love to hear from you on social media as well.